Barry, thank you so much for being with us today. We're so happy, so happy that you're here. And um, um, hopefully, as I was just uh, telling Cliff, maybe um, we will give you five minutes to tell us a little bit about uh, your book in a, a very short while. And at the end, we will take a full commentary from you on the research that you read. That would be really helpful. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Hassanin, would you like to start? It's seven. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samar, to give me this uh, opportunity to uh, start this uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the contribution of the faculty of, uh, of university in the MENA region uh, in, the, uh, in our uh, research. Their, cont their contribution actually make this uh, research and this webinar uh, happen today. Uh, special thanks to the main contributor from uh, Arabian Gulf University, Monofaya University, King Abdelaziz University, and Ain Shams University, and actually Eshumina uh, Fry. Uh, also, we would like to thank uh, Polarity uh, Partnership for giving us uh, the permission to use uh, its tool for polarity mapping and uh, assessment. Uh, uh, on behalf of the author, I also want to acknowledge Prof. Janet Grant, uh, the Director of Center of Medical Education in Context in UK, for all the effort uh, exerted in defining this, this work and aligning the information into uh, context. Uh, thank you for you all for being with us today in this webinar and we are all looking forward to your participation input and questions and we are ready to clarify all your queries inshallah thank you all and uh, please Dr. Asa. thank you professor mohammed and um, uh, just before we start i would like to congratulate professor mohammed hassanin for his recent promotion to full professor we are happy uh, to have his guidance uh, in all our work, and uh, we're happy that he is now a full professor. So congratulations, Thank Professor Mohammed. Thank you. Uh, let me just um, uh, tell you very, very quickly where this whole concept came from. Uh, today, as you see, we are quite a large team, and um, this is not the only work we, we are doing together. We have lots of uh, research initiatives that are happening at the same time. But this specific piece of work has a history. So let me just talk you quickly through the history of why we chose the topic. And um, um, maybe uh, then you will, I will leave you for the details and you will understand why the details and the des design came to place as they are. So actually, we, you all know that right after COVID-19, when we were forced to stay at home, uh, everyone was thinking uh, about what to do now and how to solve the current questions, the current dilemmas and issues. And looking at these um, dilemmas as problems that needed to be solved. We took a step back and we started thinking about what's going to happen after COVID-19 and how do we manage the change that has happened more like a polarity that needs to be managed rather than a problem that needs to be solved. We told ourselves that one day this whole issue will be over. And what we wanted to make sure of is whatever we won and uh, whatever grounds we won during the COVID-19 period, we got enough insight and input to be able to make informed decisions after this whole dilemma is over. We decided to uh, think of something to guide and help our planning. And of course, I was introduced to polarity management 10 years ago through my good friend, Cliff Kaiser, who has been my friend ever since. And I've fallen in love with polarity uh, thinking. And um, Professor Hassanin and I were talking uh, about the concept and he just came up with the idea and he said, this is something that we need to uh, think about and put in the context of the current issues that are happening. So we thought that the, per, per, I mean, the 
the most important thing that's going on now is the decision to educate our students at a distance. And that this, uh, as much as, at a, uh, as it is a dilemma, it's also an important winning that we have won for, from the COVID uh, era. So we started thinking about using the great insight of polarity partnerships and the amazing um, research-based initiatives and tools that they have to help map the context of whether to teach at a distance or to teach face-to-face. -face. This whole research is basically, basically about the methodology. And more than the outcome that comes out of it, we want uh, to, to send a message that this methodology can be used to inform decision-making in education in whatever dilemmas or, as we will learn to call them, polarities, that exist in our everyday life in education. So by the end of this hour and a half, this is what we hope to be able to do and the shift that we want to happen in your perception of how to approach decision-making in education uh, in the future. Having said that, I'd like to turn this over to my friend and colleague, Nagwa. And uh, Nagwa will tell us a little bit more about the methodology, its specifics, its details. And please listen up. If you have any questions, I would um, encourage you to write them in the chat. Our colleague, Noha, is working with you on the chat. Um, uh, and after uh, the whole thing is over, we will make sure that all your questions and are answered and all, even your opinions are conveyed. So over to Nagwa. Thank you, Samar. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are going to talk about the methodology. Uh, the methodology of our work, um, as you see, um, it's um, qualitative study utilizing the content analysis for deductive analysis. Um, next. Dr. Muhammad. Um, that was done through the five steps of the backed process, uh, backed model of the polarity map. Uh, the five steps of the backed process were seeing, mapping, assessing, learning, and leveraging. That was the sequence of the steps which we had been using through the methodology we had approached our research. First of all, seeing. Seeing the team identified the tension in the shift from the pool of face-to-face -face into the pool learning in Paris into the distance learning. We have two pools here. We have the face-to-face -face and we have the distance learning. We had to identify the tension between both pools. Next. Our participants we had in the second step, we have done mapping. Mapping was, was done with our participants. Our participants were uh, 79 uh, medical educators in number, representing uh, 19 countries, sharing in different stages during the whole process of the research, actually by uh, uh, checking the level of the uh, command chain they were working upon, it was found that 30% of them were decision maker and 70% of them were educators. First of all, all our participants were recruited after doing the initial seeing and the initial finding of the uh, of the polls, which is which were face to face and the distance learning, and then they were introduced into the Zoom meeting and a cloud meeting. The aim of the cloud meeting was to start to put an idea and start to put uh, the, the second step into action. It, it in included few sessions. The first part was an introduction to introduce people, what we are going to do, taking their consent for the participation and uh, allowing them to know the roadmap for what we are going to do. Then we went into the basic concept session. The basic concept session, which had included mainly the core competences, the core definitions in where the whole terminologies where we are going to use the, through the whole session had been introduced during that part. The, whole, the core definitions were mainly in the terms of the e-learning, online learning, 
and distance learning define uh, the main uh, the main concept of each one of them the discrepancies between the different terms and what is the common between each one of them in order to reach a common basic mutual understanding regarding what we are going to achieve in the next step after having a basic concept uh, session, we entered into a polarity session that was held by Cliff Kaiser, where we had the basic concept of the polarity and we start using uh, how to use the polarity map in order to do the further next step. Next, then our participants were divided into a four groups using a Zoom breakout room. We had group one, group two, three, and four. Group one, we're discussing what are the benefits that emerged from using distance learning post COVID-19, while group two, we're discussing the benefits of face-to-face -face that we realized after experiencing the post COVID social distance. Group four, or group three, we're discussing the drawbacks that had emerged from the distance learning in post COVID-19. Group four, we're discussing the drawbacks that we had realized that face-to-face -face teaching were uh, experienced post-COVID-19 social distance. Next. Then after finalizing that breakout rooms and that session, which was definitely video recorded and uh, taking the consent of our participants on that, the video recorded was transcripted by the researcher, it was coded, then it was thematically analyzed by two independent researcher. We found that there were key category dimensions or key themes or focus in each quadrant uh, where our participants were discussing in the four breakout rooms. These noticed key themes were mainly five, were faculty, students, curriculum, social aspects, and logistics. Next. So we entered into the third step of uh, the polarity process, the five-pact model, which was assessing. For each polarity map, assessment statement was detected and uh, utilizing uh, the back language. And then we developed a 63 assessment item. And these were generated using a tool, which is the polarity partnership with, with Cliff Kaiser with us, who's going to give us later uh, a note about that. Then a smaller team, which were seven uh, medical educator experts, uh, had refined these sentences. Then we went piloting for the uh, for the for the 63 item. Slight modification had been done to these items. Then dissemination of the uh, 63 assessment uh, assessment sentence had been done. Step four was learning. Um, after dissemination of the, uh, of the survey on the participant, uh, we had used the benchmark data to develop the strategies to maximize the benefits and minimize the limitation for each polarity emerged uh, on learning from the results we had achieved from the participants. Uh, then we also went again into the breakout rooms, into a zone meeting where we had four groups to discuss the strategies that we do need in order to maximize the benefit, maximize the benefit through an action steps and minimize the download, uh, the, the downside limitation. And this is through detection of the early warning signs that are going to tell us, stop, there's something wrong here. So we divided our groups into four groups and in every group, every uh, group was discussing something. Group one was discussing the steps that our organization need to take to maintain the benefits that emerge from using uh, uh, distance learning post COVID-19. Group two was discussing what are the steps that the organization can take to maintain the benefits that we had realized after uh, using, uh, after um, uh, post covid after realizing the face-to-face -face, um, learning um, benefits. Group three were discussing the alarming, uh, that the warning signs, the early warning signs that the organization should look for to avoid experiencing any drawbacks that could emerge from excessive use of distance learning when planning in the future uh, education interface. Group four were discussing the signs and that the, uh, the, alarm, the, the warning signs that the organization organization need to take care of in order to avoid the overuse of the face-to-face -face learning in the future steps.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nagwa. Uh, so this is the uh, citation of our uh, uh, paper. And if you scan the QR code, it will take you straight there. So do try to visit the uh, paper and um, uh, do try to leave us comments, um, maybe here or there uh, on the journal website, whatever you see po uh, possible, because there will be a sequel for this work and your uh, input would be highly appreciated. Um, thank you, Nagwa. I'd like to turn this over to Cliff and uh, stop the share screen, Mohammed, because I think uh, Cliff needs to share his screen. So what Cliff will be doing in the following uh, few minutes is recap a little bit more about the, the basic concept where this methodology was built on. Uh, so he will give us a, a, a better view on the concept of uh, polarity thinking. And of course, um, we cannot speak about polarities when Barry Johnson is in the room. Uh, unless we, we listen to him as well and uh, get a lot of his wisdom. Uh, so I'm turning it over to you, Cliff, and then Barry. Okay. Well, I, I think we can just do this through, through discussion, and I'd like to have Barry uh, join me in this. I don't really have anything slide-wise. I mean, I do have some things I could share, but I think the, the value of this is in, is in the dialogue because uh, what you all did is actually uh, no small thing. We, we need more research like this. And this tool that's been developed with our polarity assessment is something that we're, we're quite excited about. We think it's a real game changer out in the marketplace. And the reason for that is something you all actually already know. And that is that what gets measured in organizations gets done. It, it's just a, a fundamental uh, truth of organizational life. So if we can find ways in these, in these difficult polarity tensions to, to measure, we're going to facilitate uh, results that we want to achieve faster and more sustainably. So that's, that's the bottom line. The other thing is um, <clears throat> the ability to create benchmark measurements from which we can then develop these action steps and early warning signs, which become the strategy for improvement. And then at some future point, we can reassess. And when we reassess, we can compare the benchmark uh, measurements to our, our improvements. And then we can, we can learn from, from those measures and then continue to create uh, even more, more refined strategies for improvement. So this, this assessment took um, uh, quite some time to develop. And I think it's important for you all to know that, that the assessment was uh, validated in a healthcare system, a four location healthcare system in the United States and Canada. And uh, I, I, this is probably a good place to um, invite Barry into the conversation because I was not as, as involved in that as he was. So this would be a good place to just share a little bit about the history of the development of this, this tool, which um, has been a long time in development. Well, uh, thanks Cliff. Before, before uh, responding to that, I, I really want to uh, just pause for a moment to thank you Cliff and you Summer for as two really key people in making this happen. Uh, and uh, it's just, it's wonderful to see the results and to appreciate the process and how well you've described it. Um, so it's just, it, it is a real gift to all of us what you have done. So I wanna thank you both, uh, especially for this. It's, it's, um, uh, it's very heartening for me, um, the chapter that you have created for, for volume two. Um, in a lot of ways, I am, more proud of volume two that you've contributed to than volume one. And, and uh, the reason I say that is because um, it's one thing for an individual to say, I, uh, I think I've got something important to share and to share it. Um, it's, uh, it's another thing to have people like all of you um, say, coming from your life experience, coming from your wisdom to say, I think this is important and uh, I think it's important to share it. So uh, uh, that's, um, my desire has always been to be um, 
useful but not necessary. Uh, and in this case, <laughs> I was totally not yet necessary. Uh, between Cliff and Summer and the rest, Summer and the rest of you, um, you've come up with just you know this chapter in the book and this wonderful research to share with the world. So, uh, so just congratulations to everybody who's who's uh, uh, on this on this call and hearing hearing this that had any part in it. Uh, it's just great work. Um, what might be fun for you to know about in terms of of this particular research is when the uh, when the desire arrived to actually uh, build in an assessment and research. And so uh, I'd like to just share a little about that situation. Um, I was working with, uh, with Amico and uh, this was in 1993. So, um, so what, 27 years ago. And um, we had uh, uh, Amico at that time uh, brought their their top 3,000 leaders uh, from wherever they were located. They brought them to Amico's headquarters outside of Chicago, and 85 uh, leaders at a time um, were going through this leadership course. And in the uh, in the the leadership course, they had over five days. They had two and a half hours on polarity thinking. Uh, and they had my book that had just recently come out, uh, my first book. And uh, what happened is in every one of these sessions, and there were, uh, there were, I think, 42 of them or something, but they were just about, you know, just about uh, every week, they had another group coming in uh, from all over the place. And so I or some other uh, close associates of mine, I did most of the presenting in this, this two and a half hours. Well, what happened is in every one of the sessions, the, the presentation in their full five days that they said was most useful in their mind, they were most excited about was the, was the session on polarity thinking. And so it was getting rave reviews. And so they approached about halfway through this year, they uh, approached me and they said, Barry, um, we can't afford to bring the other 30,000 people who were in Amico <laughs> into, uh, into this face-to-face -face learning arrangement. And so uh, we need to be able to do essentially some distance learning on, on this. So this is 93, right? Um, and, uh, and so uh, they said, is, is there a way that we can teach this, uh, make this available on the computer somehow? And, uh, and so we started working with them on creating a, a web, a, a, there wasn't an effective web at that time, but, but a computer-based assessment. It involved five floppy disks, so you can know how early this was. And it had to do the program in both black and white and color because all computers didn't have color screens at that time. So the whole thing we designed was in this process. So, so now we're in the process of building a, uh, a, uh, a course that they could, they could take on their computers, on these floppy disks. Well, in the middle of preparing the, this course, the, uh, the CEO of Amico sat in on one of our sessions because we were in a planning process. We had representatives from Amico helping us create the course. We wanted the language to work with them uh, for them. So we had to learn the technology, how we're going to do this. And we also wanted the language to work with them. So we were in a design team with them for about six months preparing this. In the middle of that, um, the, the CEO of Amico just dropped by and sat in on one of our sessions where we were designing this course. And he says to me about the middle of this session, he says, Barry, um, how, is there any research available that, that would support that if you actually systematically brought polarity thinking to an organization, that it would have positive bottom line effective results for that organization? Is that, you know, do you have any research to back what you're, what, what you're claiming here? You know, he said it, it has a lot of face validity in our organization, managers love it, but what about the research? And I said, great point. And, and I said to him, I said, 
what, what I'd like to propose is that we do that research at Amico. He said, I said to him, I'll do it for free. I'll put my time in on this. I'm willing to bet that we can demonstrate this by doing the research. We can demonstrate the effect. I said, and you could invite a third party source, an education center. We can have the University of Chicago, University of Illinois, Northwestern University. You pick the university. I'll collaborate with them to do independent research and we will and we'll do this uh, right within with you know within your organization. And he looked at me and he said, he said, we're not going to take the time to do that. And I said, well, now you know why we don't have the research. And he smiled at me and he said, fair enough. <laughs> so, so we didn't get the research at Amico, but that triggered my my enthusiasm. I thought, what if he had said yes? What we would need to have, had he said, yes, let's do the research, we would have to know how well people were leveraging polarity. So the first question is, if we teach it, then we'd have to know, well, we've, we've been teaching it. But the next question is, well, how well are they leveraging it? How would we know how well they are actually leveraging key polarities that they identify? And then we would be able to say, okay, we have demonstrated that they're leveraging it well based on our assessment. And now we can correlate that with, has there been improvement in key bottom line areas at Amico, which would legitimate if you teach polarity thinking, you know, and you do it well, and you, you assess it, you will, if you improve the ability to assess polarities, um, you will improve the functioning of the company. We would have a control group, which would be a whole section of the company, et cetera. So there's this whole social research project that I proposed to him, you know, right in the room. And he said, we're not, we're not going to do it. And I said, okay, but then my dream was some, some time we're going to be able to do this. But the only way we can do it is we have an assessment. And that got me in 1993 in the process of trying to figure out how would you assess these polarities effectively. And so we've been working on that since then. So you're, you're at the wonderful end of applying this, you know, in, you know, in, in 19 different countries in the Middle East about how can we assess this? How do we know this is gonna, how does this support us? And so this is a culmination of, um, of a long history for me. And that's why I'm, when I'm excited about what you're doing, I'm not kidding. I mean, this, <laughs> this is just great <laughs> stuff to see this happening. Um, and to see it happening with, with little or no, virtually no input from me. I mean, at the, at the ABLE um, uh, facilitation of Cliff, and Summer and the rest of you making this happen, uh, that's why I'm so tickled about it, just, just so you know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cliff. Thank you so much, Barry, for that. And we are happy that we are at that end and at the new start, actually, of um, a long list of ideas for research that uh, we have planned in order to maximize on the uh, the hours that were spent in developing this um, uh, this tool itself and the assessment and the beauty of it and the beauty of the results that come out of it that um, if we were engaged in polarity thinking before and were in love we're in love even more after the results that you will come to see in a minute. So having said that, I'm turning it over to Mohamed Haini, my friend Mohamed Haini, who will be showing uh, everyone the results that we got out of this beautiful assessment and how we actually engaged them into the uh, recommendations that came after that. Mohamed, your call. Hello, good evening and good morning. For, uh, for Cliff and Barry. It's, um, it's my pleasure to present the results of our research. Uh, this is how, how our, um, uh, the social uh, demographics of our participants, most of them were uh, in the age of, uh, from 31 to 50 years of age. Most of them were faculty members with 30% uh, leadership or in leadership positions or education managers. Uh, and when they were asked about how would you rate your experience with distance learning, uh, 76 uh, said that it was excellent, 167 said that it's not so bad, and 29 said that it's not their best thing. 
um, so this, these are our uh, the polarity maps that uh, uh, resulted from our focus group discussions. And as uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Nagwash said, uh, we had five uh, key themes or tension areas. The first of, uh, of uh, these five, uh, five themes is the teachers, is the teachers. So this polarity map shows some upsides of a teacher when it comes to face-to-face -face, uh, teaching. For example, teachers think that they take full advantage of face-to-face -face learning opportunities and they demonstrate strong ability for face-to-face -face interpersonal skills to inspire students. The upsides for uh, distance teaching were, were uh, some of them included uh, that distance learning, we benefit from distance learning opportunities to address large numbers of students, for example. And uh, 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 on the other hand, we have another example, which is the downsides of face-to-face -face, uh, teaching, which is uh, that distance learning sessions are not as professional as they need to be. And um, for the for uh, for the face-to-face -face downsides, an example of them is classroom class classroom learning sessions are not as professional as they need to be. Limited opportunities for face-to-face -face learning uh, undermines the ability of faculty to make meaningful connections with students. So, Mohammed, this is the downside of distance learning because you just uh, you said of face-to-face -face by mistake. Okay, so this is the downside identified in the teacher attention area uh, when this. when using um, uh, distance learning. Yes. For the second theme, which is, uh, or, the, or the second tension area, which is um, our students, uh, examples of, of the upsides are that students, for face-to-face, -face, that students benefit from the unique opportunities and that face-to-face -face learning options provide learning opportunities where there are technological challenges. For the, uh, the upsides of, of uh, distance learning, Participants uh, through the discussions in the breakout rooms think uh, that distance learning options provide learning opportunities when physically connecting is a challenge, like in the COVID-19 situation. Downsides for face-to-face uh, -face that students express frustration as a result of limitations of face-to-face -face learning. And for example, uh, students with special needs do not feel at ease attending physically while the downsides for the distance learning were, were uh, that not all students are getting the same chance, for example, to learn when we do distance learning because of the uh, uh, access to internet. Uh, the third tension area was the, uh, the social interaction and the upsides of face-to-face uh, of -face in, this, in this tension area. An example of them is that we encourage collaborative learning in our face-to-face -face methods. We encourage individual academic performance achievement in our face-to-face -face learning methods. While the upsides for the distance learning that we encourage also individual academic performance achievement in our distance learning methods, it's, it's the same. Strong uh, relationships with our students result from role modeling and trust in the distance learning space. Downsides for face-to-face -face include there are few opportunities to connect outside the classroom. While in the distance learning, we have very little privacy. The downside, we have little very little privacy allowed for students and faculty. Um, our face-to-face -face learning options lack individual academic performance focus. The fourth area was the curriculum. Examples of upsides uh, that were we, we thought of in the focus groups was that we collect paper proof of learning and on-site exams in the face-to-face -face learning. While in the distance learning upsides, an example of it that we discover new applications and modalities of distance learning. As regarding downside 
aspects of face-to-face -face in the curriculum tension area. One of them was that we miss aspects of knowledge in face-to-face -face instruction and cannot finish the knowledge content of the curriculum. While the downsides for distance learning that skills, especially clinical skills, cannot be taught properly in distance learning, at least until now. Our last uh, tension area was the logistics, upsides of face-to-face -face and logistics that effective use of face-to-face -face learning is more cost effective. Coming to, uh, uh, to logistics and, and distance learning, we use variety of distance learning tools. Distance learning provides for the time efficiency not available in classroom. The downsides for face-to-face -face and logistics, an example of them that we overspend on face-to-face -face learning for the benefits it provides. While for, uh, uh, for the downsides of distance learning, one of them was we miss opportunities for learning effectiveness that face-to-face -face learning provides. So as you can see, there are upsides and downsides for each method or each modality and in these five tension areas. This is uh, where, where uh, the, the methodology of uh, polarity thinking is uh, again used to uh, scientifically calculate or uh, um, uh, determine the level of uh, uh, how leverage, leverage, leverage yes, the yes. leverage, <laughs> and yes, I, I forgot the word. <laughs> so, so when it's when it's red or uh, or orange, that means it's either uh, in danger or risky. So the the single tension area of our studied five tension areas was the social uh, aspect. So the social aspect looks like that the leveraging there is somehow at a good level. So in the, in the third stage of this research, uh, we invited the participants to discuss the warning signs when using face-to-face -face teaching, the warning signs when using distance learning in order to minimize uh, the possibilities for uh, the downsides and to sustain the positive aspects of each of these modalities. An example of the downsides of the warning signs that uh, a school, for example, management or administration should take care of or continuously monitor and, at, uh, and be aware that at this level, it is a warning sign that, for example, dissatisfaction and low scores in 30% peer evaluation among students. Uh, for the distance learning, 30% of students believe that they are at a disadvantage with distance learning survey question, for example. So we've, uh, the group uh, enumerated uh, uh, the, some examples of, of the warning signs that might be used to manage this and to maximize the benefit and reduce the risk. Some of the action steps also to ensure the sustainability of this of face-to-face -face learning uh, were, dis were discussed and, and suggested, and also action steps when using distance learning. One of the action steps suggested for, for when you while using face-to-face -face learning is to encourage face-to-face -face communication skill sessions to be a core uh, or part of the core courses or the core course requirements to maximize the benefit of that those upsides that we've just described. Uh, action steps for, uh, for using distance learning, an example of them was activate university auditing system to ensure that the proper tools are uh, used in distance learning by the quality assurance unit audits. Uh, that concludes our uh, results. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you, thank you so much, Mohammed, for uh, um, laying out our results. And when you say them, they seem like um, a very beautiful points um, uh, that um, that are very well listed. Uh, but actually, they remind me of a lot of work that was exerted and <laughs> effort over months. <laughs> Whenever you say any sentence, it just reminds me of how this sentence came up. It was not an easy task at all. But uh, I, I'd like 
like to thank the whole team for the effort that they exerted in making this um, uh, work actually a reality because um, I remember each one of you investing a lot of their time, their effort and their knowledge into this. So thank you so much for this. And um, uh, I think at this point, we need to pause for just a little bit of time and hear maybe from Barry um, a little bit of reflection on the results uh, and then open it up for uh, questions from the, um, uh, from the attendees. Barry, you're muted. Okay, uh, so, um, well, one of the things I'd like to, that, that came to mind as you were talking about, uh, Cliff was mentioning uh, about the, the benefits of having an assessment and the importance of, of assessing something because you get what you measure. Uh, and I'd just like to reinforce that point that he was making and talk about one of the side benefits that happens when you build assessments in and then you pay attention to them. Um, when you uh, are sharing results about polarities with people in the organization, every time you do that, you're reinforcing the mindset that, that this is a both and issue. We can do this and we can do this. So you're reinforcing and thinking and building that into the culture so that when they experience another tension that shows up in education, um, what happens is they think, well, is this tension, is this tension about uh, so a problem we can solve, or might this tension be about a polarity? And if it is, then we need to bring and thinking to it. We need to connect the two with and. And so, the fact that that uh, things are being assessed in pairs creates what I call parallel thinking or and thinking. And, and it reinforces that. So everybody in the organization, in an ideal arrangement, everybody in the organization, when they experience you know, some significant tension or disagreement, whether it's the students uh, experiencing it among students or students with faculty or faculty administration, um, what would happen is the tendency to say, I wonder if this is around a polarity. And, and that, that instant, uh, checking in with themselves and with this situation, is this a polarity? Because if it is, not only uh, am, uh, am I right and the person I might be in disagreement with, not only are we both right, but we both need each other. So it can change the conversation uh, instantly um, when, that, when that shift happens. So, um, so that's, that's a whole cultural benefit is that people are able to see and leverage and want to leverage polarities, which can enhance the relationships um, in various levels of the system and between different parts of the system. Uh, so that's, to me, uh, really important. In terms of this assessment, um, I think it's, it's um, helpful to, to have you uh, have identified uh, a number of early warnings uh, and early warnings, as you mentioned in your own, uh, when I read the chapter and your summary of the assessment, early warnings are the most difficult thing to come up with. Um, action steps are much easier. We're much more used to, to thinking of action steps because they tend to be sort of project oriented solutions to problems. How do we do this to solve it? And the only difference is when you've got a polarity, you have two sets of essentially problem solving processes that are going on. And, and, but the early warnings are, are difficult because you want to find them as early as possible. That makes it harder. Um, late warnings are pretty easy, but they're blatant. So the question is, how can you find them early? And the second is, how do you make them measurable? And in the, in the issue of measurability, um, this is where we can learn from the six, uh, you know, from the six Sigma folks. Um, the people who are, uh, you know, the people who are very good at measuring um, because measuring is so important in the whole quality movement. So when the quality movement moved across the globe, um, it, one of the key benefits of this, of the, of the quality movement is coming up with concrete measures. How well are we doing in our efforts at quality? And of course, we know that it started off in engineering and technology 
and in manufacturing, but it has spread to education and other areas as well. And so um, this, we, can, we can learn from those people and appreciate those people who are very measurement conscious and quantitatively uh, conscious to help us uh, in generating uh, early warnings. So those are just some thoughts um, about this. Um, and like you say, I think it is, is gonna be really helpful not only for the ongoing attention to enhancing your capacity uh, to, to accelerate uh, both your uh, distance learning and face-to-face -face learning, that we can enhance the quality of both that assumption is a wonderful assumption to go into, and this will help people in doing that for sure. Uh, uh, so uh, it also, I think it will help, as you've mentioned in your own uh, results uh, of your uh, process and your research, is hopefully it will result in people looking at other polarities, looking for other polarities in education, which could be intentionally identified and mapped and assessed if they would like. So that option becomes available just throughout the system. Thank you, Barry, so much. Cliff, do you have any comments? Well, I, I think this point about, um, about uh, the, the benefit that measurement provides, especially with the early warning signs, so you're not allowing for a normalized deviance to, to occur which happens a lot in organizations. I'm sure you've experienced where we say, well, it's just always been that way around here. That's just kind of how it is. Well, it doesn't have to be. And uh, so, so measuring these early warning signs on both poles is, is, is difficult and, um, and extremely important. But there's another dimension I, of this whole discussion that I think and Barry, Barry touched on. I'd just like to reinforce a little bit more. And that is that, um, my, my experience is that in highly analytical environments, healthcare, education, engineering, um, it's no accident that there's a bias towards or thinking because, because there's been this, um, this long history of development of, of strong credibility for being a great problem solvers and solving a problem and moving on. And there's, there's a great benefit to that either or technical thinking. Um, and when, when we get into leadership, um, Rania, I think, yeah, there we go. Um, uh, when we get into leadership um, and organization work, we are squarely in the world of, of and. Uh, and if we try to apply either or thinking to those and issues, then that's, that, that's the, the beginning of dis, dysfunctional uh, results that, that, can, that can begin to escalate into extreme polarization around, around issues because we're trying to come up with the right answer when there are actually two rights. And, um, and so I think the, the, um, this natural bias in, in highly analytical environments for uh, thinking and or is actually a setup for the, the downside of or thinking. And, and so what we're doing when we measure and what we're doing when we develop these, these measurements to ensure we're not in the downsides of, 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 of these interdependencies, it isn't a small thing. We're, we're, um, we're developing dual strategies using um, both or thinking and thinking together as a polarity to leverage. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, just to tap on um, the the polarity aspect of this, I just I understand that um, it's something. Um, it's it's a thinking. It's a um, uh, it's a it's a way of um, of approaching uh, issues in the organization. I just want to focus a little bit more on the issue underhand, which is distance learning and how this was approached as a polarity. And um, it, w this happened in our research or in our piece of work at a time when it was posed as an only solution for a problem that existed. So being able to over to surpass this and think of 
um, this within the whole context of education and what and the possibility of what could be in the future rather than this as um, a single solution to a problem and uh, even managing it and dealing with it as such i think i, I think um uh, what we came up with as a team as and as even all these people that attended the focus group i think what these people came up with could be a beautiful roadmap to trying to understand how to deal with um uh, situations like the one we were in in an effective manner and the reason i'm saying that is that while you were talking and while barry was talking i kept getting um getting visions of barry's story <laughs> when he was uh speaking more uh speaking about where this whole idea of the mapping process came from and the the um uh, the lady that he was um uh, i think you were giving her a um um uh, i don't i don't know what to call it he's um, a clinical psychologist and he was working with uh, with someone and the whole mapping concept and visualizing this in real life uh, it it kind of transcends into visualizing this in the organization as well and you start seeing the map all around you whenever you see people you start seeing the, the map the way barry saw the map the first time if you'd like to tell us a little bit more about how to how you visualize the map to begin with barry that would be helpful and could i interject something very just very quickly barry if you could interweave it into the story because it it, it ties into our story and mm -hmm. that's the distinction between um between chosen polarities and intrinsic polarities, uh, because we were dealing with a chosen polarity in this context of this of this research. And I think it'd be a great, great, great way to just tease out um, that dimension. Okay, well, maybe maybe I'll start with that first and then go into the story. Um, so um, uh, the I think it is significant that your research is around a chosen polarity. Um, uh, a, a, an example of an intrinsic polarity is the polarity of centralized and decentralized, right? So if you have an organization of more than one person, <laughs> then you're going to be dealing with the polarity of centralized and decentralized. And, and so um, uh, you're going to want to decentralize to, uh, you know, to empower uh, the parts to take initiative and, and be a creative uh, and, and express their uniqueness. And you're going to want to centralize to coordinate what the two of you are trying to do if it's just a two person shop. Now, obviously, when you get a 30,000 employee organization, centralized and decentralized becomes more complicated, but the basic polarity is going to be there. You can't go someplace and decide, are we going to, are we going to do centralized or decentralized? You are in the middle of a system of more than of more than one person, so you are in fact dealing with centralized and decentralized, just like you are dealing with activity and rest uh, as another intrinsic polarity. You can't go someplace and decide, I wonder if I want to do activity or rest today. You know, it's like no, you're going to be doing some version of it your whole life. So, um, but there are times when there are two. Um, very important dimensions of life that you're saying, we think we need to do both, or we want to do both at this point in time. We want to be good at, at distance learning, and we want to be good at face-to-face -face learning, and, and both of those seem important to us. How do we do those both well? And now you're choosing to, to say, we want to pay attention to both, we want to get the benefits that each offer, and we want to create some synergy between them. We think there can be that that really good job at face to face can actually help us in our distance learning and a really good job at distance learning can support us in our face to face. Uh, so they they create a you can create a synergy between these two dimensions, both of which we think are important. Uh, and that will lead us to whatever that greater purpose is for quality education for our students quality life for our planet. Um, so, so that's the distinction between 
uh, chosen polarities and intrinsic polarities. In terms of the story about the, in 1975, the, um, the beginning of the polarity map in the first place, it, there's a little bit of prehistory to make sense of this. Uh, and, and that is that um, for, uh, for five years from, 60, from 1965 to 1970, I lived and worked in East Harlem in New York City, it, wanting to intentionally appreciate what life was like for the urban poor. Um, and so, uh, and amongst uh, 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 black and Puerto Rican people uh, who were uh, in, uh, who lived in concentrated areas in, in East Harlem. And in that process, I found myself um, getting involved in protest movements and uh, working in the civil rights movement and, uh, and, and in opposition to the war in Vietnam. And after five years of that, I was in and out of seminary during this time, but after five years of that, I, I, just, I ended up deciding that I didn't want to become um, a minister. I was preparing, going through seminary to become a, a, a minister, Christian minister. And I decided that actually I wanted, uh, my ministry was more about dealing with the things I was, I was struggling with around the civil rights movement and the peace movement. And I thought, I don't want to 50 years from now, this was 50 years ago, by the way. So 50 years ago, I, I decided I, I, I don't want 50 years from now to only be protesting things that aren't working. There's a legitimate, I think, position to take that we need, if things aren't working well, we need to confront our organizations or our countries when they're not working humanely. But I didn't want to be just protesting that. I thought, I want to understand how do we get ourselves into, how do we end up with racism and poverty and sexism? How do we end up invading other countries? Um, what's behind that so that I could somehow increase the likelihood that we run uh, organizations that work for everybody, nation states that work for everybody. And so that was the pursuit I, I got into at 1970. In that process, I wanted to start with myself. How, how do I make change in myself? How do I have self-improvement, self-awareness? And then I wanted to work with larger and larger systems, moving up to work with, with nations. So I imagine that was the that was the process. I got involved in training as a Gestalt therapist, and, we, and so then I was working with individually. Then I was working with couples. Then I was working with groups. And so every time I was working with larger and larger systems, just trying to learn what makes them work effectively. I ran a residential treatment program for heroin addicts, and I'm in a slightly larger place. So it's right after I had completed, I had started a residential treatment program for heroin addicts. And I was working as the director for uh, the, the, essentially the chief operating officer for a drug treatment facility that had uh, outpatient treatment, uh, the residential treatment program and community outreach. And I was in that position, but I was completing a two year training in Gestalt methods. So that's the context. And, and so in this session, uh, the woman I'll call her Anne comes in to see me and uh, I didn't know her. She knew me from the community because I was fairly active and, and vocal in the community as uh, organizing around uh, issues of, uh, primarily issues of race uh, and, uh, and uh, racism in, the, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I was at the time. So she had some awareness of me. And I, so I asked her, this is the first session. I said, so what brings you here? And she said, I, I want to be more like you. And I said, well, what would that mean to be more like me? <laughs> One does not have to be Freud or, or Jung to know, uh, or, or Fritz Perls, to know this is kind of a loaded uh, statement. So I asked her, I said, well, what would that mean to be more like me? And she said, oh, she said, you, you, you seem to be making a difference in the city. You, you seem to be helping out. Uh, you seem to know what you want and you're, and you're going after it, um, and uh, you're having something to offer. And I said, well, I said, I, my hope is that that's true. I said, I think there's some truth to that. I said, well, how do you see yourself? And she said, well, she said, I'm not, I'm not doing anything for anybody, and um, I, I, don't, I don't really know what I want to do, 
And if I did know what I want to do, I don't know if I would have enough gumption to actually even do it. So she was really putting herself down about how terrible she was, right? And, uh, and so I'm, I'm looking, we're sitting in these two chairs and I'm looking across at her. And I said, you know, I said, it's, it's almost like you could put your description of me, we could put that on one side of my chair, which is like, well, that's some positive things about Barry. And I said, and then we could put the, the, the way you describe yourself, which is really kind of putting yourself down a lot. We could put that, I'm not denying that it might be true, but, but let's say we put that on one side of your chair. I said, now, if you could go from that side of your chair to this side of my chair, if you could make that move, you wouldn't be here. So there's something, you know what you claim is wrong with you and what's right with me. But what's getting in the way of you getting to this side of my chair. And I said, I think it has to do with the other side of each of our chairs. I think there's something on the other I know there's something in the other side of my chair, which isn't all that great about me that we're not talking about. And I got a hunch there's something on the other side of your chair that's actually pretty positive about you that we're not talking about. And so I'd like to conduct an experiment. Would you be willing to do it? And she said, well, what is it? And I said, what I want to do is I want to start on the side of your chair where you see yourself right now, which is a not very positive image. I want to start there. And I, I would like to just look at what's there. Really be clear. Okay, what is here? So notice we're going, we're going to populate the four quadrants, right, which emerged. I said, so, so what would, let's, just, let's just together figure out what's there. What's that like? And I'd like you to actually experience that not just talk about it, but experience it when we're there. Then when we're done, we've gotten, you know, we, we've identified what's there and we've had an experience of it. Then we're gonna move to the other part of the other side of your chair and we'll make a list what's there, we'll experience it. And then we're gonna go to, you know, this, this negative part of me that we haven't talked about. And then we'll end up where you want to end up, which is the upside of my chair, to the right, the right hand side of me. Is that okay? And she said, okay. So I had a flip chart uh, uh, you know, page that I had with me and a flip chart stand. So I take the flip chart easel and I set it down in this one side of her chair. And I said, well, what might we call the chairs here? Maybe, maybe it would help us to identify the, what, was, what is in each side of our chair if we agree on what, what the, what's the chair itself. And, and the, first, the first one was being, the, her chair was being passive and being receptive. And and mine was being, uh, being active and being giving, right? So it was giving and receiving, passive and receptive were the two chairs. And I said, okay. I said, You're, what we're looking at now is this, this chair is, is receiving, being passive. Um, and uh, and what, what, do you, what do you, again, what's the, what do you, how do you identify yourself? And so we, and I started writing them down on this, on this page. And she said, oh, she said, I don't know anything. I've got nothing to offer. I don't have any energy, um, no direction. And this list went on and on. It was really, you know, she was just putting herself in a, in a quicksand, you know, she was just, it was just a disaster. And, and so I wrote all this and, and I looked at her and I said, I said, it sounds like you already know how this feels. You know, we don't have to do anything to have you feel this. I said, this sounds terrible. And I can see how it would feel awful. I said, I feel awful even being here with you. You know, I mean, this is really a sad state of affairs. And she said, yes, it is. <laughs> so I said, okay, we've got this. Let's tear the page off and put it right here in this part side of your chair. So I went to the other side of her chair and I said, okay, what, what, uh, when we look at being passive and being receptive, what are the positive benefits of doing that? And she said, I don't have a clue. And I said, well, I think we need to find something. <laughs> and so we're standing there with this blank piece of page. And I said, well, I said, one thing is, I said, in terms of being receptive, I said, that seems to me being willing to be a learner, being willing to listen, being willing to receive gifts and knowledge from others. I said, that, that seems to be pretty positive stuff. And so we ended up getting a, quite a list of being, of being that learner. I said, you're coming here to, to learn about yourself uh, and, to, and to receive that. I said, that's, 
I said, that's, that seems to be a pretty positive thing. So we, we generate a list of what it means to be a receiver and, um, and, and a learner, being willing to learn. And I said, I said, now I said, I'm trying to think of something we could do here so you could experience the being a learner, you know, and, and being a receiver. What could we do? And I had, had done some, some work in massage as a part of my Gestalt training. And, and I said to her, I said, I've got an idea. What if you just, we were all, we were standing up, you know, as we were going through these different spaces. She was standing, I said, what if you turn your back to me and just close your eyes and I will, I will uh, just come behind you and put my hands on your shoulders and just give you a shoulder massage on your neck and your shoulders, just to, just to let you feel like you're receiving something from me. It'll be just, you know, just a, a nice touch on your, on your shoulders. And I said, I'd like you to imagine I'm going to imagine this with you. So I'm going to imagine that energy is coming from above me, down through my body, into my hands, and into your body. I'm going to be giving you as much energy as I can imagine just flowing from me to you. I'd like you to imagine yourself just taking it in. Just relax and see if you can feel energy coming from me as a receiver. Are you willing to do this? She said, okay. So... So we do this, and I start just massaging her shoulders, you know, lightly. And, and all of a sudden, she just, says, she just gives this sort of, you can feel her shoulders relax. You know, just, she just sort of relaxes. She said, oh, that feels so good. And I said, it does. And she said, yes. I said, so there is something good about this spot. <laughs> and she said, yes, I'm loving it. And I said, okay, great. So... So it's clear that there is an upside or a benefit to being receptive and being a learner. She said, yep, agreed. I said, okay. So I grab the flip chart and I go to the next spot. Now this is the downside of what she, you know, had seen about me. She had this upside, you know, I'm being, you know, knowing what I'm doing and making a contribution, all that stuff. But now there's this downside and I take the flip chart. I go to that downside and I turn around and she has gone right to the point halfway between where the upside of her pole, the passive receptive pole, going to the downside of being of the giving pole, you know, active and giving. And she just stopped there. And so I'm looking back at her not coming into that quadrant. And I said to her, I said, I said, what's happening? She said, I'm not going there. And I said, you're not going there. You're not coming here. And she said, no, I'm not. And I said, why are you not coming here? What's here? And she said, that's being a bitch. And I said, oh. I said, well, what does that mean to be a bitch? She said, oh, that's being a know-it-all. That's being arrogant. That's being pushy. And, uh, and I'm not going to go there. So I... I left the flip chart behind and I walked back to her part of the room <laughs> on, this, on this, the one side of her chair. And I said, Ann, I said, we've got some decisions to make here. I said, now you, first of all, you're in charge of whether you, of the decisions about whether you go to these things and what is done in these quadrants. I said, that's up to you. And I said, so, so we could decide right now that this is not okay for you this was an evening session um, uh, after regular work hours I had. And uh, I said, we could, we could decide, you could decide that you're not going to go there now. We could decide that you're never going to go there. I said, that's your call. I said, um, so, so I said, uh, you can let me know. I said, so that's one choice. We're just not going to go there. I said, and another choice is that we're gonna, we will go there and we will do the same thing we've done in the previous two. We're going to make a list of what it means to be a bitch. What is all that about for you? And I'm going to ask you to be the, the most powerful bitch you can possibly be to me in that quadrant. That's what's going to happen there if we go. Right. And I said, so that's and then I said, then we'll then we'll go to the upside and we'll continue the process. I said, what is not a choice for you right now is to skip this place and just go to where you want to be the upside of this pole, the other side of my chair. At some level, I just don't believe 
you, we can skip this place. You have to somehow engage this in a way uh, that, and, and so, so I said, what is your choice? Are you gonna, you know, do you wanna, you wanna go and do this or do you wanna just, just end it uh, here? And she asked me two questions. She said, um, she said uh, both questions, by the way, she knew the answer, which shows you how important the, the, uh, the questions were. Um, and the first, um, whoops, there's something uh, moving on the screen. Is somebody moving through the screen with, uh, huh, okay, good. Um, so uh, it's showing up on my, on my, uh, uh, I think someone's, I think someone's sharing a screen to, to uh, illustrate your, your, uh, your story. <laughs> oh, I don't, well, okay, might be. <laughs> but uh. it's, so, so, so let me. Yeah, uh, actually, it is me. I'm uh, trying to draw on the picture of the chair setting to show people oh, because yeah. I did have it somewhere. Oh, I, Here I it see. is. Here oh, okay. it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. Go great. Ahead. So, so anyway, so, she, so she asked me two questions, and what's in these questions are very important when you think about people wanting to make a change, but having some internal resistance to make change or an organization wanting to make a change, but experiencing resistance to the change. It doesn't matter. The resistance to the change. She's, the two questions she asked first was, will you go with me? Hmm. When we want to face our fears, we need some support to do it, right? She was afraid of, 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 of being of, of, of actually being the bitch. She was afraid of being seen as a bitch, experiencing herself as a bitch. She didn't want to go there without some support. So the first question, will you go with me? I said, yes. The next uh, question she said is, I don't have to stay there, do I? This is the other fear. One fear is going there alone. The other fear is being caught there and never getting out. And the fear of being caught there is what keeps us from even going, even embracing that other pole because I'll get caught in its downside. So even though I might have a desire for the upside, the fear is if I go there, I'm going to get caught in the downside. So I said to her, yes, I'll go with you. Um, we'll make a list of what it means to be a bitch. You'll be the best bitch possible to me there. And then we'll move on and we'll go up to, you know, the upside. So she said, okay. So we get there and I said, okay, Tell me again what, what it means to be a bitch. Well, that, be, that is being a know-it-all. Now, notice the, the contrast here. The, the downside she was from is know nothing. But she's afraid of, quote, being a know-it-all. So there's this whole parallel thing that's developing. She said, that's being a know-it-all. That's being uh, pushy, arrogant, cocky, you know, full of yourself. I'm the biggest, you know, I'm the best thing since sliced bread. Whatever that is, you know, the kind of arrogance and pushy. And, and she, she kept, she used the word know-it-all a couple of times. And so I said to her, okay, I said, this is a powerful list. I said, uh, I can understand how you wouldn't want to be seen as a bitch. I said, but I'd like to experience you being a bitch. I said, so, so how about, and I'd like to have you experience your being a bitch to me. So I said, I've got a suggestion. <laughs> what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to, um, to think of something that you probably know more about than me. It doesn't matter whether I know about it or not. But, but in your mind, you think, I probably know no, more about this than Barry does. I said, whatever that is. I said then, and it could be just your own life. But whatever it is, I'd like you to start talking to me in a very arrogant fashion about how much you know about this and how little I know about it. And just be as arrogant and as bitch as you can be. Are you willing to try that? And she said, well, okay. I said, you have something in mind? She said, yes. I said, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> so, so she puts her hands on her hips and, and she starts talking to me and then she starts walking closer to me and her eyes get a little bit more squinty, you know, and her jaw gets a little bit tight and she starts pointing at me with her finger and then she walks right up to me. She starts pushing me in the chest. She starts poking me in the chest and she's talking. I don't even remember what it was she was talking about, but I do remember her poking me in the chest. 
and she was getting louder and louder. And then all of a sudden she started smiling. And I said, Anne, this isn't totally unforeign. This isn't totally foreign territory for you, is it? <laughs> and she said, no. She said, but, but when I get this way, I get embarrassed and I feel badly about my behavior and I run over to the other side and I just shut myself down. And I said, that's what I do when I get here. <laughs> when, I, when I find myself being arrogant or pushy, I said, I, I get embarrassed and I just kind of shut down and go over and, 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 and listen and sense, and, you know, so wait a minute, I need to listen here because I'm just, you know. So, so we both agreed that we, we get here sometimes and we move away from it. And so, so I said, okay, we've done that, you know, good job at being a bitch. And so now let's go up to this final place. And, uh, and so this was what she, I said, tell me again, what's up here? What you, when you said you wanted to be more like me, you said there were a bunch of things about me you wanted to be like, say again what that is. And let's write those on the flip chart. We brought the flip chart up there. So she brainstormed this quadrant real quickly. And she said, uh, she said, well, um, it's having something to offer, making a contribution, um, knowing what you want and going after it. And I said, um, okay. I said, so I notice that you didn't stay in your apartment and sit around, poor as me. You got out of your apartment and you came here. You came after some help. I said, so, so the first point is that you've already done that. You have come here for help. So you're taking action. Um, you know what you want. You want to, um, you know, you, you want to be more uh, uh, active. Be clear about what you want, and more willing to go after it. The first thing you did was you came here, so you are going after it. That's the first point. You're already doing this. Second point is, I said, I'd like you to to think over the last, I said, just the last week, maybe two weeks, but no longer than two weeks. I want you to tell me anything that you have done for anyone in these last two weeks. And she said, well, I, I, I work a tutor program. So I, I tutor a couple of kids two nights a week. Um, I also, uh, my mother's sick, so I'm bringing her dinner um, every night uh, to her place and having dinner with her. And she started, <laughs> she started making this list that was just, I mean, she was doing all sorts of stuff within the last 14 days where she was making a difference in other people's lives, but it wasn't registering for her, right? So she started making this list and, and I said, Anne, I said, that is, that's a tremendous list I've written here. I said, I said it seems to me that, that you are already doing what you have cl been claiming you want to do, you just need to somehow appreciate it more or just, just be, be more appreciative and understand the reality that that is doing and you'd like to maybe do more of it. Is that true that you're actually doing a lot of it and you just like to do some more? And she said, well, I, I guess it is. <laughs> and I said, okay. I said, fair is fair. Remember when we were over in the upside of your pole and I was being I was the one who was giving the energy, but with a shoulder up and you were being the one receiving. I said, would you be willing to switch places? I would like to turn my back to you. Uh, I'll close my eyes. I'll imagine you bringing energy to my body. And I'd like you to, to uh, you know, if you're willing to just give me a shoulder massage. And I'd like you to imagine energy coming down into your body through you to me. And I'll see if I can feel it. Would you be willing to do that? And she says, well, I'll try it. I said, okay. So, so I turn my back to her, close my eyes, and I feel her hands landing on my, on my shoulders. And, um, and she's starting to, to massage my shoulders lightly. And all of a sudden, or not real quickly, but, but just over in, within a few, you know, with the, when, within five or 10 seconds, all of a sudden, her hands just start trembling. Um, and probably for those of you who know about energy work, you know, one of the ways that energy shows up is just with a kind of a trembling. You've got so much energy that it's just, you know, your, your body's kind of vibrating. So I could feel her, I could feel her hands trembling on my shoulder. And so, 
I slowly turned around and looked at her and she had these just big tears rolling down her face and a big smile on her face. And I said, Ann, I said, what's going on? And she said, uh, um, Um, this was uh, 45 years ago, right? Um, and she said, um, I'm here. Um, this is where um, I wanted to be when I came in. And now, now this took um, this took less than an hour. Um, but it was, it was uh, very powerful for both of us. And I went home that night and I could not sleep. I thought, um, what happened? Now, five years earlier, I left New York City. Um, to try to figure out how we get our systems in trouble and how we could move, how we could create systems. And I had learned in Gestalt psychology about paradoxical change in my two year training. And I thought, um, this, this is what paradoxical change looks like, what it feels like. Um, and I thought, let's just, let me just retrace what happened. And, and, and my question was, would it apply to an organization? Would it apply to a nation state? Um, and I thought, um, it does. So I'm guessing you all know now why I asked Barry to say that story, because it's so inspiring to the point that after you hear Barry speaking about embodying polarities that way, you tend to see polarities everywhere you go. So Barry, you're amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead. Let me just share if I could for just a, just a, just a minute. I'd like to just share that showed up in that process because they're the fundamental truths that have not changed in 45 years, right? We keep learning all the time. Together, we keep learning about this phenomena. But one of the things was what she was clear about and what she was not clear about. She was clear about, quote, the problem with herself. And she was clear about the solution, which was to be like me, right? So she had a gap analysis going on. What she thought was, you know, I got, I'm clear about the problem with me. You know, I'm, I'm too passive. You know, I'm not making a contribution. I'm weak and passive. What I need to do is be more outgoing and I, I need to move there. And all I'm looking for is a strategy from you to help me to get from here to here, right? And the leveraging I'm, process. Right? And so I, so I need to go from there to there. So it's a gap analysis. You know, what's wrong with me? What would be better about me over there? And how do I get there? And she came in for the gap analysis answer. What's the strategy? I mean, what, what coincidentally happened for me, because in Gestalt, you tend to use yourself as a resource. I thought, wait a minute, there's more about me than what she's seeing. And I thought, well, where do I put that? And that's when I thought, well, I need to put this more about me on the, on the other side of my chair. Now, once that happened, I realized, oh, there's also a part about her we're not looking at, which is the upside of her chair. Now, once that happened, now I was aware there's two other elements. And I thought, how are those elements getting in the way of her doing what she's wanting to do? And so I decided to take the trip. So I joined her in this downside, uh, starting where she was, which is what, what were her complaints about herself. And then I said, well, let's look at what might be a positive dimension. Because if you try to launch a change effort just from deprecation, just from what's bad about us, that's not a good platform. It's like trying to, trying to start a race from quicksand. The more you run, the, the quicker you sink. It's not a platform for the change. The platform for the change is the, other, is the upside of the very pole you're on. 
So mm -hmm. when we got to the upside and she saw there was something positive about being receptive, you know, okay, I can be a learner. I'm willing to learn from others. I'm, I'm receptive. It, it, it means I can, in order to let people give something to me, I need to be willing to receive them. There's an upside. Once she experienced that platform from that pull, she had, she now became aware that there was a downside to where she was headed before she was totally blind to there being any downside to what she was idealizing about me. Right. But now she had enough support that she had, if you will, the, 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 the ability to at least look at and say, Oh shit, that is terrible. You know, <laughs> it's like, I I'm not going there. Now notice this wasn't even in her imagination when she came in and looked at me and idealized me and said, you're all about this, you know, but now she had enough awareness of this upset, enough, if you will, support to be able to own up to the fact, uh Oh, I know what's over here, you know, and that is being a bitch. So, so that's the other step. You know, she needed the platform to move also though. She needed to deal with it. She needed to be supported by me and she needed to physically essentially go through the downside of the pole she wanted to go towards in order to gain the benefits of that. Now, this in the Christian tradition is, is the life, death, and resurrection. She needed to experience at some level th this reality and know that that reality was not the whole, was not the whole thing. There's more. And the more is the, is the upside of the pull. So she needed to experience that there is a downside to this, but I can get through it. I can be more than a bitch in terms of the whole, this whole pull, right? So yes, there's times when I'm bitchy, but I'm much more than that. I'm much more than that negative image of me. Matter of fact, I've got something to offer. As a matter of fact, I'm discovering now I'm actually offering it. So, so that was already there with her. So the whole polarity was already, she, it was a part of her life, but she was hyper aware of the downside of one pole. So when organizations come to us and they're hyper aware of the downside of one pole and they say, we got a problem here and we need to go here. And they come to us as a consultant. They say, let's go here. The, the whole question is, is this, is this place I want to go from essentially the downside of a pole of a polarity? And is where I want to go essentially the upside of another pole? And if it is, then I need to see these other two as a resource because I, and I need to first identify the upside of the pole I'm on. That's the platform from which to engage what I'm afraid of. And once, once I've done it, once I've gone through that downside and go to the other upside, now I know that yes, I can survive it. The only way we know we can survive a fight with a loved one is to have had the fight and have survived it. So, so the only way we know that we can access um, the upside of a pole uh, in spite of its downside is to have experienced that downside and then to have experienced the fact that you have made it through. So she needed to experience, I can go through this, you know, I can own up to the bitch in me and I can still be an okay, lovable, wonderful person. And so that's, that's what all of us discover when we go through polarities is that we're always more than the negative attributes we give to ourselves or the negative attributes that others put on us. We're always more than that. And also the organizations we're working with are always more than their, than their uh, poorest performance. Also nation states, they're always more than, than their worst times when they are most um, inhumane to their own citizens or to other citizens. And it's that the polarity maps helps us see the more. Thank you, Barry. That was amazing. I think you recapped. I mean, you put you put a lid on everything we wanted to say today. And uh, I, for everyone who's on this call, I just want you to to get a sense of how valuable the past few minutes were. I would pay anything over the past 10 years to be able to sit down and listen to this from Barry Johnson himself. So that's uh, that was uh, amazing giving from your side, Barry. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, Henny, I just want to turn this over to you. 
to see if there are any questions that need to be addressed among the attendees. Um, uh, thank you all for this amazing uh, webinar. Thank you, Perry, for this uh, fantastic uh, story, uh, really touching our hearts. Um, I think uh, that uh, the, we have to comment one from uh, uh, Professor uh, Rania, Rania Hamid, uh, asking about uh, the use of the hybrid uh, experience in learning. Um, uh, uh, th she said that uh, um, the problem is mastering the technology. Uh, the biggest problem, I think, is mastering the technology from the point of view of Dr. Rania Ham. Also, Professor Mona Abu Saud. Let, uh, me, let me just address this very quickly, Hani. And um, uh, I think master the problem of mastering technology is kind of like um, uh, like being bi a bitch in uh, in Barry Johnson's story, it makes no difference. It's the same issue. Yes, mastering the technology is um, uh, it's uh, it's we have been perceiving this as the main the core issue in transforming to distant learning over the past few months. But actually, it's kind of something that we had to go through in order to receive the upside of the beauty of going through distance learning. In addition to this, also lots of other issues like being totally unprofessional, being um, uh, totally uh, having students drop out, all that stuff that can be considered the downside is where we had feared to go over the past few years, but had to go. And we had to visit that part of the polarity in order to gain the upside of uh, uh, distance learning. As we hope in the future, we can actually start to be there now. After having all this apprehension about failing, I think it's time now to start celebrating a huge success that has been happening over the past few months and more success to come, hopefully. Sorry for interrupting, Henny. Uh, also, Professor Mona Abu Saud uh, uh, asking about so in essence, the polarity thinking is a sort of SWOT analysis of every situation in life. And uh, Cliff answered here. Uh, Cliff, you could answer this. Yes. Um, uh, was that the, uh, the somewhat of the, the quote that I put in the chat? Or is there a question? No, can you just answer out I, loud, Cliff? Uh, OK, OK. So the question, specifically, the question is what? Uh, uh, Ethan says, a polarity thinking is a sort of a SWOT analysis in life. Oh, yes. Uh, so what's the thing I put in the chat? So the SWOT analysis, oh, I might even have these slides. Uh, I was sharing this with, uh, with somebody today. Oh, good. I do. Uh, guess what? Uh, we lucked out on that one. So I'm going to share a screen real quick. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Barry was sharing a bit about the continuity and transformation polarity um, in his story. And um, at one level, we can look at this tension between continuity and transformation, and we can look at continuity um, from a SWOT analysis where the strengths are something we're clear about. We know their strengths. So that's a, that's a benefit of the continuity poll. That's one thing that, that we like. So we know what we're good at. And, and you heard the, that example in, in Barry's story. Um, what's not always evident in the SWOT analysis is that sometimes it's the very strength overused to the neglect of the other poll that can create the very weaknesses that we're experiencing. And if we're only looking at SWOT from the standpoint of a Gantt chart or just developing a, a list of things that look like they're these inter, independent uh, things, then we, we might not see this. So this is where, this is a perfect example of how the polarity lens can supplement and enhance an existing uh, methodology like SWOT, which is very powerful, but it's even more powerful now if it's actually true that you realize, oh my gosh, yes, I have overused that strength. That's, that, that could be responsible at some, at some degree for this weakness. And then if we look at SWOT analysis in terms of the O, 
there's where the opportunities, the, the, the transformation um, involves opportunities. We don't have it yet, but we want it and we're envisioning something positive about it. So this is where we're projecting positively into the future. Boy, if we could get out of these weaknesses and get to these strengths, things would sure be a lot better, wouldn't they? Uh, and as soon as we articulate those our opportunities, sometimes it's those very opportunities that trigger the awareness of, oh yeah, but if I go there, it might land me here. And I, I'm afraid to go there. And if I go there, I might end up having to stay there. And not only would I have to stay there, but look at this, I'm also losing my strengths. So, so this, is how, this is how the SWOT analysis could be supplemented and enhanced by looking at how the dynamic between <clears throat> the dimensions of SWOT in the, con in the continuity and transformation polarity could, could show up and, and really provide quite um, a beneficial use of the polarity map because this infinity loop that you're learning about in terms of how these dynamics show up as an interdependency, see that the Gantt chart with the, with the columns on a spreadsheet doesn't give you this. It doesn't give you the connection, the interdependent connection between all these independent dimensions of, of SWAT. This gives you a much more complete way of seeing how the energy dynamic works. And, it's not that there's anything wrong with SWAT without the polarity map. It's just that it doesn't have energy. And any model or tool or approach that doesn't have energy is, frankly, a, a model or, or tool or approach that doesn't have energy. That's, that, that, that's what it's missing. So this is a very important um, component as a value add. And there are lots of them in the leadership development and organizational literature where there's some great approaches that can be supplemented and enhanced through a polarity lens by being able to see this very important dynamic at play. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, from uh, Professor Hadir Fouad, uh, thank you for kind, your kind words. And uh, Professor Hadir has a question. Uh, could you please explain the difference between hybrid and blended learning from your experience and uh, how could we motivate and increase engagement of both staff and the students for distance learning? Okay, okay. Who, who would you like to answer this question, Yuhani? Um, I could answer this question if uh, Go ahead, if you go want. ahead, please. Um, uh, hybrid and blended learning, both are synonym terms. Uh, they use both uh, distance learning and the face-to-face -face learning. Uh, it is just about the arrangement of using both. Uh, both should be implemented and should have a place in the curriculum. Uh, from my point of view, in order to increase the engagement of both staff and the students, from my experience, is to decrease the burden and the overload of both staff and students. It should be an interesting and interactive experience, not uh, a duty and uh, heavy work all the time. Uh, there are uh, multiple tools to increase the engagement through the uh, distance and online learning. And also um, from our publication and our experience, we appreciate the value of social life in face-to-face -face learning. Yeah, absolutely. May I, may I just um, intervene here just a little bit? Because, uh, Henny, I do, be, I do believe that... Um, uh, the, the term blended learning and um, uh, what's the other one? Hybrid learning. Hybrid learning yeah. yeah, they can be used interchangeably and there is a difference between them. If you come to look, it depends upon uh, the, the, um, um, the ratio between what you do online to what you do face to face. But my question to you, Dr. Hadir, is why do you care what the difference is? <laughs> Because actually, we get into this whole discussion about what's the difference between blended learning and hybrid learning that we 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 um, we, do, we don't this. grasp the concept of the value of what we are actually doing. We lose this in the terminology, and I have heard this discussion numerously in meetings over the past few months, as if it really matters. 
what the difference is between hybrid and blended learning. Nagwa, go ahead. This is your uh, job. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are used interchangeably, but some people felt that they are not equally uh, the same. So they started to find what are the differences, to find that, that the hybrid is the larger spectrum regarding learning or plants or um, uh, any type of thing. You are doing hybrid. You are doing things together. But blended is something that is mostly to the learning where you are going to put two things together online and face-to-face. -face. However, as Summer said, let's focus on the goal, not on the terminology, because uh, by the end, uh, the objective and the outcome is what matters rather than the terminology. And I do echo Hani and all what he said, Dr. Hani, and all what he said regarding the student engagement techniques. Um, uh, we need not to focus on the technology. Technology is only a tool. You need just to, to minimize the technology to suit the lowest uh, level of your students and your teacher and to master that lowest level it's not about the fancy of the technology it's about how to be interactive and how to gain each other during the course so good good perfect um, course design uh, interactivity student-centeredness active learning these are the keys in order to have student engagement thank you Okay, from uh, Professor Arania, uh, we are struggling to face down sides, but it needs the teamwork and the collaboration. Uh, also, uh, Professor Arania said that culture and mindset of us, both teachers and students regarding distance learning, indeed, especially in Egypt, must be changed. Uh, Clef, you have a comment. You could uh, say it. Uh, yeah, well... I think, I think probably the, the most value I could add to, to this part of the discussion is to just, just mention, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a, perhaps a, a good bridge between the last comment around hybrid and blended learning and, and, and this question, that is this process that we're talking about when we're trying to um, deconstruct uh, some of these tensions so that we can see them more completely and see ourselves and others more completely is a values and language clarification process. And if I've learned anything from, from my work with Barry uh, in this, in this uh, ex exploration of, of, of polarity tensions, it's that um, language can be incredibly imprecise, staggeringly imprecise. We think we know what we're talking about when we say these words and use these um, terms and everything. And, and we don't. And so as we start exploring the dimensions of the, of the tension through the, the seeing and mapping process, what happens is the, the, there's a byproduct that's created. And that is that we see ourselves and others more completely and we get clear on what we mean when we say this term or that term. And then we can move forward faster and more sustainably. And this happens in, uh, on the culture of a, of a team or in a family or in an organization or in a, in a national system. And so these, uh, I guess the, the, the net net of this, this um, I guess soapbox or whatever you wanna call it that I'm, I'm sharing is, um, is that the, there's a lot of juice in this process itself. I mean, there, there, there is a five steps, but in the five steps, what's happening is this values and language clarification process that allows us to understand ourselves and others uh, better. <laughs> and so that there's a lot of, um, I guess the dirty little secret here is there's a, there's a lot in the process. So don't, um, so, so don't rush it and, and, and don't think it's just about getting through the steps. Absolutely. And um, I'm, I'm realizing that we are an hour and a half behind our time. <laughs> 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 no, actually, How did actually, that happen? Uh, <laughs> no idea. <laughs> actually, um, we, I would sit here till morning, actually, without complaining. But um, I'd like to thank everyone on this call and all those yes. people who st stuck around and showed up and um, are willing to read and um, dive more into this experience of the study. Um, so thank you so much for all of you. Also, I just want to thank uh, yes, Cliff and Barry. And Cliff is holding in his hand Barry's book. 
Okay, this book, this is, um, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? It's issue one or what do you call it? Uh, volume one. Volume, volume one. one. Volume one. Yeah. 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 And we're waiting for volume two. And Barry, do please send that to me as well. Because yeah. <laughs> Barry sent me volume one with uh, a, a great sentence written in, uh, at the beginning, which, uh, which I put on Facebook and everywhere. And I was so proud of it just because Barry wrote it so uh, I will be waiting for volume two as well and I will be sharing um, uh, readings out of these and uh, uh, areas that I find interesting out of this on my social <coughs> media as I did with the first one uh, and I do encourage you to go on Amazon and just take a look at that book and um, uh, try to uh, get it it's it's really useful uh, our experience is in that book what's the chapter it's chapter I I think it's 40, but it's changing yeah. a little bit, but yeah. Okay, so uh, do look for our research there, our experience there. It's a chapter that we wrote in uh, collaboration with all the universities that are included, including King Abdelaziz University, uh, Arabian Gulf University, Munufeya University, Ain Shams University, and of course, with the help of Polarity Partnerships. So having said that, I just want to wrap up this call, say goodbye to everyone. Uh, do you want to could say I something? End, yeah, could I end with a quote? Could I end with yeah. a quick quote? Do that. It's from Rumi. <clears throat> Your hand opens and closes, opens and closes. If it were, were always a fist or always stretched open, you would be paralyzed. Your deepest presence is in every small contracting and expanding. The two as beautifully balanced and coordinated as bird's wings. Lovely, <laughs> lovely, Cliff. Thank you so much for that. Barry, yeah. thank you so much for being with us today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And do, do let us see it's how so your awesome. polarity works out and uh, see you soon <laughs> yeah, in our upcoming you. work. Thank you so much.